Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited to hear your ideas. Uh, my name's Terry, and I am chairing the session for you. Very cool. Nice to meet you, Terry. How are nice you doing? Nice to meet you as well. Doing all right. Um, so, you know, we'll get started right in a, um, at the half hour. And um, I have a few kind of technical, logistical um instructions to share with our audience. And then um, I'll turn it over to you. Um, if you want to give us a little bit of background about yourself, you're more than welcome to at the beginning, um, once I turn it over. Um, and we have 50 minutes, you know, for the entire session. And what we've typically been doing is um, ha having the presenter present for 40 of those minutes and then reserving 10 minutes at the end for any questions. Gotcha. Okay. And try to not make anybody fall asleep with their eyes <laughs> open or anything of the like. These are our major goals. Okay. That'll be great. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's going to be an uphill battle, but we'll see how we do. That's what we like to do to fairly newish assistant professors is put them in impossible situations <laughs> and hopefully yeah. flourish. Well, see, that's the thing though. Like with with doing all of this through zoom we, we can pretend that there's a technological error and just like it all ends at five minutes in or whatever so we'll be all right we'll be all right how have things been going for you thus far i'm, I'm guessing you're running been, around all over it, it's been a great day so far but terry can fill you in the children's lit stand has been less attended but they've been really good i think yeah, yeah. they've been they, amazing they've been fantastic very cool. The YA crowd, they don't want to come down to our level with the picture books. I don't know. 32 pages, all illustrated. It's kind of nice. Paul, I'm enjoying looking at all of the pictures or all of the books um, behind you. Yeah, I know. This is my domicile. This is a fraction of a fraction of yeah. a fraction. This is the office here on campus, the one at the house. Uh, I got three little guys, and it's it's insanely loud yeah. in my place. It was oh, office sure. or nowhere today. You pro you chose wisely. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of my favorite books of the past couple of years is New Kid, which is right behind you. And oh, I so good. Yes. And I love Class Act as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And kind of cool to see a graphic novel that won a like a Newberry. Yeah. Know, I thought that was fantastic. Winner. Yeah. Good stuff. And I believe that it's there's going to be a third book. I'm imagining um, you're in right. The series. Yeah. Um because I got to go to, an, to a virtual event um, where Jerry Craft was speaking, and I think he said there was going to be a third one. So oh, eagerly cool. awaiting that. Very cool. I'm working on a little study right now with a friend where we're looking at the kind of the unique affordances and limitations of um, graphic novel adaptations of award winning novels mm -hmm. and kind of saying, you know, what do these that the others can't and vice versa. That that will be um, absolutely fascinating to um, look at. It would, um, at I don't know if you're familiar with Study and Scrutiny. Uh, no. Um, it's an online um, open access journal focused on um, studies in young adult literature. Mm -hmm. And um, we recently just um, kind of ended the call for um, a themed issue on adaptation in young adult literature. 
Oh, okay. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So adaptation is certainly on, has been on my mind a lot these days. Yeah, I'm sure. You're probably you're almost over it if you were the one editing a journal yeah. this whole time. No, well, either fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't have to edit it. I was, I'm in charge of the book reviews. Oh, okay. And um, so we do academic book reviews as well as trade book reviews. Yeah. And um, I um, read a book on adaptation uh of um, in young adult novels, and then interviewed the um, editors um, for study and scrutiny. So, gotcha. Terry, because you have a single presenter, you also have the luxury of having a slower start if you want to wait a couple of minutes because okay, they're perfect so um and i and like i say I, i'll bounce around and uh we're recording this paul so i i can check and, and dock your pay if you screw anything up so well, that's what i was thinking uh <laughs> i was like how do i stop this this could be held against me now and i've been i've been throwing <laughs> dana under the bus because dana was a student that i got introduced to last semester she's such an awesome awesome student and she's going to tell you she's new at it and she's not very good at it and, but any question you just ask her she, she's top notch i don't okay. know if you picked on her or not or not but she was a joy to have in class and then uh um oh she's blushing there she's saying plus she's teaching <laughs> at the elementary school that my brothers went to of oh, 40 years ago or more, but it's a new building. And oh, then Nikki cool. joined and Nikki is one of our, one of our new doc students too, who's been an asset teaching adjunct for us. So you can throw Nikki under the bus too. Say, Nikki, okay. I know this is your specialty. Uh, you know all about this, so chime in. And then Amanda Malili is here and Amanda's our, um, our resource librarian, our technical, our teaching and resource librarian, who's just fabulous. So you've got a really good group of people here. They feel free to engage them act actively in this group. Well, so, I know it's kind of funky just seeing the floating names um, and then trying to imagine what, what these humans on the other side of said names might actually look like. Well, you can have them, if you guys are having a small group, you can make them show, you, show them who you are and stuff. Yeah. He's probably you know, eating birthday cake and stuff. Cause I know she had a daughter that, you know, had a birthday yesterday. So she might not want to show. Okay. Doing. Oh, and then Jason, she's now Jason. Got, oh. I know that guy. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave you to it. Terry, okay. you're in charge. Okay. Jason, how the hey, heck are oh. you? Man? Hey, oh, man. I owe nothing. How the heck are you? Look at you looking all professorial. Nah, it's fake. Uh, from the navel up, I'm taking care of myself. You guys have no idea what's going on off screen. So, <laughs> the the life of a Zoom Zoom professor. Yeah, it's such a trip. So weird to be, yeah, to only cyberly connect with humans. Are you going back in the fall? Yeah, yeah. I think um, they've even started opening up for some summer classes. Are already having like a face to face. Mm -hmm. so i'm excited to be in rooms with people and uh you just remember what that's like me too me too that's what the vaccines are for right yeah we're immortal hey renee renee is defending on monday and I, um jocelyn yeah. jocelyn just cleared her proposal stage so crazy so so crazy i'm sure they'll both crush it well, it's good to see you. I look forward to your presentation. Yeah, we'll see if I can woo you and wow you. Here it goes. <laughs> well, I think we can go ahead and um, get started. I know we have some people who need to leave early to go to other meetings. Um, and I wanna make sure that you get the opportunity to hear about this fantastic um, presentation. So hello and welcome to this children's literature, literature session on designing difficult discussions, how to prepare picture book read alouds that deconstruct stereotypes. Um, and just a few um, logistical notes um, as we get started. This session is being recorded. Um, we have about 50 minutes for um, the session, about 
whole. So we'll dedicate around 40 minutes to the presentation and to Paul and 10 minutes to questions. Um, I will kindly interrupt, you know, if after the presentation has gone on for 40 minutes to make sure that we do have time for questions. Um, audience members, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the chat and I'll ask them after the presentation. Um, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to direct them to our host, um, Larry McLeod. I think he might be showing up on your screens as um, UNLVYA Summit 3. Um, so you can message him in the chat. But hopefully there won't be any technical issues. We have been very fortunate so far this, um, this conference. Um, the session does work best if you switch your view to speaker view rather than gallery view so that you can see the speaker consistently. Um, and I am now um, very excited to turn this over to our presenter, um, who will introduce himself. Um, and it is Paul Ricks from Brigham Young University. Yeah, I have to turn myself on because you can't even hear anybody clap on the other side of the on the other side of things. And um, yes, I welcome, if I talk for 40 minutes and we haven't, if I haven't shut it down volitionally, please step in. That sounds torturous to have to just uh, put up with that. So um, yes, my name is Paul Ricks. Um, I'm a professor here at BYU um, of children's literature, 37 uh, year old Pisces for what it's worth. And um in, a, in another life, I was an elementary teacher, upper grades, taught fifth and sixth grades um, here stateside, and then also taught at a high school in Mozambique for a couple of years before that. Um, my research primarily applies critical lenses to children's texts. Um, and I know that gets a little bit the space for children's texts and YA, it's a little contentious. But um, typically, we're going to kind of say like birth to about age 14. And then recognizing that those numbers don't mean anything, because what does it mean to, you know, have a text for a 14 year old or a seven year old or anything else. But, um, but that's kind of the space I occupy. And then um, one line of my research specifically looks at the ways that read alouds can be operationalized to get people to talk about race class, gender, um, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, some of my research has looked at how teacher candidates have responded to picture book read alouds, and Jason's aware of that. Uh, he got to read uh, some beasts of some documents. Um, but today, what I'm going to try to do for us, and, and I think it's, it's actually pretty approachable, even though it might require some heavy lifting as far as time is concerned on your end, is, is how to prepare for, for difficult conversations. The vast majority of scholarship that looks at read aloud, um, that read alouds through any types of lenses, kind of looks at preparation as, here's how you need to practice to be a fluent model. And here's, here are some of the performative elements, you know, of like how, how to make it engaging. But what I'm talking about is actual critical examinations of the texts in order to get people to talk about um, the world differently than they have before. So that's kind of some of the inroads that I'm, I'm gonna try to make. Um, as far as this little presentation, I'll go ahead and share the screen with you and let you know what's coming down the pike. So, ba -da -ba -da. yeah. So outlining just through four kind of guiding questions, we're going to use um, Adichie's uh, The Danger of a Single Story, kind of that, I don't know, modern classic of a TED talk. And we're going to look at a couple minutes of that, kind of unpack what she means about single stories. Then we're going to say, um, look at how sharing paired picture books can help us to interrogate said single stories. Then we're gonna look at interactive read alouds, kind of see what they can do. And finally, how can we prepare for them? So it's gonna be kind of drinking out of a fire hose initially, but then quickly, I think it'll become interactive for us and kind of enjoyable maybe even. So who knows, we'll see. So this is what often shows up when 
um, if you're looking for this TED talk on, on YouTube or anything else, the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story the only story. As we watch a couple minutes of a clip, um, wherein she is presenting this idea of a single story for, we're not gonna have time to see everything, but she initially talks about how she was, she was only shown American and European picture books as a child. And so she grew up thinking that all stories had to have white children, that you had to eat apples, that you had to have blonde hair. And it wasn't until she was introduced to African authors that that single story was dismantled. As we watch it though, what I'm thinking might be the most productive use of our time is to fire away in the chat um, any word associations we have with what she's saying. She's gonna keep using the phrase, the danger of a single story. And any words that come to mind as we're thinking of her single stories that she talks about, let's just throw them in there. And as we do, I think we'll, we'll be able to start to unpack this for each other. So here we go, shall we? I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> She assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago, in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa, and other countries. So after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, 
had seen Fide's family. Okay. So um, I liked what was thrown up in the chat. And I think um, when we're talking about single stories, well, I don't want to be reductive of this TED talk and somehow say this is what it definitively is. One, one idea that comes to my mind is this, this one size fits all as opposed to nuance, um, generalizations rather than the particular or the specific. And if we're talking about critical conversations, we wanna open spaces for the specific and the particular rather than speak in these, these broad generalizations. So um, let me quickly relate a, uh, an experience to you. I was visiting a fourth grade classroom. It was a dual immersion classroom and there were 50% of the students, their native uh, language was English, 50% of the students, their native language was Spanish. We had been sharing um, some ideas about how to acquire language quickly and what literature could do. And we used this story, Two White Rabbits by Jairo Buitrago and uh, illustrated by Rafael Yachting. And, um, we were just talking about immigration. It was uh, a topic that we thought would work well for the group. It was one that had been showing up in politics a lot. And we wanted to push people to think about the world differently. Um, but the quote that kind of blew us away as we were doing a read aloud, on the last spread, you see a wall, a barrier, and you're not sure which side you're really on. There's some magical realism at play. You don't really know what has happened to some of the people. But a quote from one of the fourth graders um, that showed up was this one. We have to build a wall because they're taking our jobs. Now, as a, as a visiting uh, instructor to the classroom, you got to be careful, right? It's not your space. You don't own it. And yet, it's a strange thing to have something like this thrown at you, a fourth grader. We have to build a wall because they're taking our jobs. What jobs, nine-year-old? What job is it that you have? Moreover, and I think kind of maybe more like what, what was scarier to us was that it wasn't taken up by some of the other students or even the other teachers. Lots of people either bought into it or were silenced by it. And we want to kind of dismantle that, right? So we thought and we looked into the literature of how we could help this classroom. And we started um, creating text pairs on critical topics. Hey, these two about gender nonconformity. Hey, these two about modern representation of um, Native American people. Hey, these two about forgotten histories like Japanese internment camps. And when you pair texts, that literally is giving another story. The first one, it can scaffold the second. It can help readers to start make these intertextual connections. And then it can provide other perspectives. Sure, that makes sense. But what we wanted was two stories that were in some ways very similar in an effort to show students that just because a story is this is similar that we can't be used tokenistically that one can unlock the other and that as we do um, we can start to dismantle these single stories however when we started to share these in these um, small groups with this group of fourth grade learners dual language speakers we recognized that sometimes our inability to think about stereotypes, to think about st single stories prior to um, reading these with the students actually made it so there were these reifications, there were these reconstructions, there were these stereotypes that were actually being built up despite our best efforts. And therefore we said, hey, this is something that we probably ought to unpack. So a few colleagues and I that were working in that school set up a study and I'll show you some of the things that we found, okay? The two texts, one is called Two White Rabbits, the other is Poncho Rabbit. I'll tell you why we, um, Poncho Rabbit and a Coyote, I'll tell you why we paired them. Similarities include that they are both penned by Latinx authors, uh, created by Latinx illustrators. The central topics and themes, um, it's their, their migrant tales of people coming to the United States. They have amb ambiguous endings. We thought that was an interesting um, space for open-ended discussion. 
anthropomorphized animals, specifically coyotes, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Spanish language featured and back matter with contextual information, okay? Differences, there are different genres, different illustrative style, different narrator voices. Um, they're not perfectly the same. And, and that's really quite important as we want to expose readers to a, a wide range of texts. As far as what interactive read alouds can do and how they can enhance critical conversations, the read aloud lets students talk in a space that's safe, but it's still guided by a teacher, right? It's not just haphazard, it's not completely um, anarchistic. Instead, it is this guided discussion, but where student voices are elevated and some, and on some levels breaking down hierarchies, right? Um, ad additionally, it values what students bring. So for those who buy into reader response theories, this can be very, very important, kind of from Rosenblatt type uh, stances. And interactive, for those who are kind of unfamiliar with that term, it's just, these are uh, read alouds where you wouldn't wait and have everybody sit crisscross applesauce and be quiet all the way until the very end. Student talking is encouraged. You go ahead and allow for organic prompts. And we're trying to get people talking the whole time to start seeing, hearing, understanding, and feeling for each other, okay? The way that we kind of saw Adichie's um, TED Talk as inroads is when we look at the way that people prepare for read alouds, like I said, usually it's through the performative aspects and how to model fluency and what types of questions to ask and how do we make good predictions, kind of these literacy skill based um, approaches rather than content, rather than spaces to actually talk about things that might, that we believe really matter. So um, what we're trying to doing this preparation is not, hey, this is where, how you put a post-it note on that page to ask this question. It's, hey, this is how you kind of look at yourself as a reader to unpack, unpack some of your biases in order to have a better and more productive read aloud. So the two questions that can guide your preparations, and while they come across as incredibly simple, I believe are actually pretty difficult if you'll go ahead and engage with them. So the first is, which single stories can be dismantled or deconstructed by pairing these texts, right? And which single stories can potentially be reified or reconstructed? I'll just show you, um, we found three of each when we did a, a critical um, content analysis and I'll, I'll show you what we found, okay? The potential deconstructions when you have these two texts together. It could dismantle the idea that picture books are these benign stories for children. I don't know from a YA audience if people are already willing to buy into that or not. The 32 page picture books, like that they are not just necessarily for, for five-year-olds, but let me show you what I mean. This picture book um, where we often think of as safe and uncritical spaces for children. Here we've got the story of a child and her father who are coming to the United States in an undocumented fashion. Money, poverty is an issue, right? Thinking of the interanimation kind of from Piercy and semiotics, looking at the words and the pictures together, this phrase is like the boy and his grandmother look at us the way people we meet on the road look at us are these class distinctions and maybe racialized readings. And all of that can come into play. It's sophisticated, right? Frank Serafini would go there, Lawrence Sipe would go there. And we can't say, oh, picture books don't matter, they're for kids, especially these ones from an international context where they're showing things that we don't often see um, by American author illustrators. Similarly, in Poncho Rabbit, we see somebody starving to death and death is an actual possibility in this text, not just something that's metaphorical, but where one of the characters may be killed by another of the characters. And we often see that in fairy tales where things are kind of kept at a distance. But when we remember that Poncho Rabbit is supposed to be a stand-in for a certain type of person, and a coyote is supposed to be a stand-in for another, it becomes um, pretty threatening and something that some people might be uncomfortable with. 
you can't have that. That's too scary for kids. You can't have that. That's too hardcore. It's too damaging. Well, that's a, dis that's a story that gets dismantled through pairing these texts. A second, undocumented immigrants are all violent criminals. Now, I'm not saying that these things are true. I'm saying that these are stereotypes that are not, but that deserve to be dismantled, right? But you can imagine the vitriolic rhetoric that you've been hearing for some time now, um, and perhaps how these stories can dismantle them. So take a look. Do these look like violent criminals? Do these look like the quote drug lords and quote rapists that are coming to quote our country? Pretty scary words, right? Do these look like the violent criminals? No, no, and no. That's text A. How about text B? Well, here too, no. A father is teaching his children. He's reading from a book. It's a safe place. And hey, that's a lot like me. Or hey, that's a lot like her. Or hey, that's not just somebody who carries an AK-47. That's not just somebody who sells drugs. Okay. Also, we're watching people who are leaving to go and do hard work, honest labor, dismantling a single story. And even beyond that, that it's all adults who are coming here. They're all taking our jobs. No, it's a lot of children. It's a lot of people who are not entering the workforce. They're just looking for a better, safer way of life. Okay, third one that can be dismantled. It's easy to cross the US-Mexico border. We don't have a wall, so everybody's getting in. Not true. Look at the statistics. There are lots of people who are dying in those circumstances. There are lots of people who are having some serious difficulties. And these texts show that riding atop trains, um, as dangerous as that is, crossing rivers, as dangerous as that is, riding atop trains, as dangerous as that is, crossing the rivers, as dangerous as that is, dismantling the single stories. Now, oh, they're conducting a good read aloud were as easy as just throwing the right text in front of the right people and waiting for the magic. We children's lit folks, maybe librarians, we like to imagine that that is real, but it's not, right? Any story in the right hands can do the right thing and any story in the wrong hands can do the wrong thing. And sometimes those wrong hands are ours. And so we asked ourselves, if the wrong hands were ours, what stories, single stories, stereotypes, damaging, racialized, sexualized, genderized stereotypes might be reified? And we found the following three. Okay, if all you do is pair these two texts, potentially one might read that all immigrants from Mexico enter the US illegally because what is shown is that. It's not somebody passing through with documentation. It's not somebody passing through little ticket booths. It's those who are riding atop trains. It's those who are um, cruising through tunnels and paying people off using bribes, right? Potentially then, if we're not careful, it could reify. All coyotes are less than human. I'm imagining most people know what that term means, but it's um, the term given to those who lead people across a border. Oftentimes, um, I mean, almost always you have to pay to do that and a lot of atrocity, atrocities have been documented where coyotes, once they have somebody's money, they don't necessarily take somebody across the border. Coyotes, once somebody's money runs out, sometimes people are shot or left in the middle of a desert to die or thrown off of a boat and thrown into a river. That's atrocious and it's traumatic and it's hor horrific, but it's not saying that every single person who leads people across the border is like that. But look at these two texts together. Poncho Rabbit has been anthropomorphized and he is given human qualities. He wears clothes, he walks on two legs, even though he's a rabbit and should be walking on four if he were left in the natural world. But the coyote is more feral, right? Almost no clothing left to be on all fours. And then the eyes as well have this red, which Molly Bang would say, it increases the amount of danger. One particular reading then could be 
all people who lead people across the borders are not to be trusted, are dangerous beyond dangerous, are more beast than human, and therefore we don't have to really care about what happens to them, okay? Something similar could be said from a certain type of reading of the picture book um, Two White Rabbits. Again, an anthropomorphized animal is a stand-in for a type of human, but because it's left as a beast, right, it is read differently by many humans, less important, more dangerous, not to be trusted. Now, of course, that is purposeful on, on the part of the authors and the illustrators, but we have to be very careful that it doesn't become the only story, the single story. Last one, all border patrol officers are heartless, right? The depictions in this text, probably because these um, characters are secondary or tertiary characters, meaning they're not given prominence, they're not shown on most of the spreads, they're not the main characters that we follow, and therefore we get a very, um, they're not the round characters, these are the flat characters, we just see them just for a hot second, but what we see are kind of people who are shown as brutes, and who are shown as violent, and maybe by extension, who are heartless. Similarly, I've already shown this spread from Poncho Rabbit, right, who can be paid off as long as their bellies are filled, then they don't care what happens to the people. One reading, one single story reading could be, if these two texts are paired, that all Border Patrol officers are bad. Now, I am not suggesting for even a second that that's what these stories really do. That they can deconstruct all these stories or that they can reify them all or excuse me, that they will or that they will, but that they can and that they can. And so an idea to think through is that no one text or no one read aloud is ever gonna be sufficient and no two texts and no two read alouds are ever gonna be sufficient to debunk, dismantle and deconstruct all the single stories, right? But it is a starting point. And an interactive read aloud is a starting point because it can get people talking. What I wish would have happened when we had gone into that classroom is rather than giving the text to the teacher, having them let the students read it and then us coming back and asking questions, I wish, I wish, I wish that we had engaged with the story as an interactive read aloud. And when somebody said they're taking all of our jobs, that we could have talked in real time about that instead of kind of being blasted, scared and not knowing what to do. Um, as you do your own critical analyses of texts and preparing for read alouds, trying to look at your own biases, your own prejudices, you're probably going to find that there are going to be more questions than answers. I still think that's productive. I really, 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 really do. Um, and this last little piece that planning read alouds is important, but there's also a danger in over planning them. We don't want to be so constricted and restrictive that we don't allow for the organic flow, right? That we don't allow for what really could be productive, which might be comments like the ones that were made, but actually talking about them afterwards. Um, in a second, after some questions, if there are questions to be had, uh, we can read a four page picture book together and we can go through this together as we would preparing for a read aloud, which I, which I hope um, you guys will join me in. But before we do, before we do, before we do, um, I wonder if there are any questions to be had, if there are thoughts and feelings that people are working through, and if there are any ideas that are passing through the synapses that you want to talk about now. What do you say, my friends? And if you have any questions, you are welcome to put them in the chat, or if you would like to unmute yourself and ask Paul directly, you are welcome to do that as well. Dangerous. It's in real time. What's going to happen? <laughs> well, Paul, while people are thinking, um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, 
do you have any suggestions in terms of resources where um, people can find picture books that you know would allow for the sort of exploration and these conversations to take place? Yes, absolutely. So, um, well, a, a couple of different things come to mind. So, a lot of research has looked at the Caldecott and the Newberry as these are the books that we should all care about. But thankfully, gratefully, in the last 10 to 15 years, ALA, right, has all of these um, book awards that are specific to certain cultural groups. And there's uh, burgeoning research in those areas. So you're looking at Native American and Pacific Island awards, you're looking at um, the Stonewall, you're looking at lots of lots of spaces that way. And those are our text sets that I think together can be very, very helpful. Um, also, there's a, a great little article that I can put in the chat in a second as well by Kessler and some colleagues, and it walks through, hey, these are, these are some questions you can ask almost as you're looking at any book, because any text could be read multiculturally. It's just that often when something is coming from the majority culture, uh, those lenses aren't necessarily the ones that are applied. Everything requires a ton of background knowledge. Everything requires text and context. And so that's, um, I'll, I'll try to throw that in here in, in okay. just a second. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, not so much a question, but a, um, but a comment from Dana. Um, I like the idea of pairing books to detokenize a group of people. Many books are labeled as diverse simply because they have a non-white character or concept. So this was this was so great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to jot down. I have a, a couple other texts if, if you're just looking for recommendations about how to dismantle certain of your other um, single stories. Let me let me pull those for you right now. And afterwards, if you want to contact me, I can I can go ahead and um, give you these. We're we're using them for a a, a more expansive study. Um, a couple. The first is by Jessica Love. It's called Julian is a Mermaid, and this is a nearly wordless text. And what it shows is a young boy who, as he sees some people dressed up, these beautiful women dressed up on the the train, he says, "Grandma, those are mermaids." She said, yes, and he said, I'm a mermaid too. He kind of goes, um, starts to dress up as a mermaid and then how that's accepted within his um, cultural, cultural space. Um, the one that we paired with that was Morris Micklewhite and the Tangerine Dress, about a young boy who likes to wear a dress that reminds him of the color of his mother's hair and also a tiger that envelops him and kind of gets him some strength. And that's by Christine uh, Balbuccino. Dismantling the, st the stereotype of any one way to be Muslim is Golden Domes and Silver Lanterns, a Muslim book of colors. And we paired that uh, with Mark Gonzalez's Yo Soy Muslim, where we have a Latin American representation of somebody who is Muslim and um, not the stereotypical Middle East, and is one of the religions that is the fastest growing the world over, uh, something that can be helpful there. Um, for, other, for other texts that you're trying, or excuse me, for other stereotypes that you're trying to dismantle, we have Fry Bread, a Native American family story, and we paired that with Jingle Dancer, both because it's modern day representation of Native American characters, which breaks, breaks down the vanishing um, Indian myth. Um, uh, pretty, pretty negative stereotype in and of itself. And then looking at um, different representations of class, we have Last Stop on Market Street and uh, Jackie Woodson's The Day You Begin can be really important. And I like these ones because they're not so on the nose, like, hey, here's money. 
hey, here, this person doesn't have a car. Instead, it's a story, and these are components of, right? Um, one of my favorite pairings that we were able to get a little later on was uh, Black cultural spaces, and we looked at Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut, looking at the Black Barbershop, and then Bippity Bop Barbershop, and in um, both stories of family, both stories of cultural understanding, and both stories of non-toxic -to masculinity, but still power and empowerment. Sorry to blow up the, the feed and everything else. Can I make a comment? Yes, yes, please. Thank you, Paul. Is it Paul is the doctor? I didn't want to say Dr. Oh, yeah, yeah, Paul, fire away. You're fine. It was just for a comment. I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, the Islamic thing, a Muslim thing, because I'm a traditional, I practice traditional Islam. Okay. But you wouldn't know that with me, you know, wearing polo and the things I do, people still have that traditional idea of Muslim. So I appreciate right. you mentioning that. Oh, yeah. And I think, I think that's um, like a, a perfect example of what we're going for, which is we just want nuance instead of archetype, right? And it's not that somebody wearing a certain type of hat or a certain type of robe doesn't exist. It's just that we don't want to, um, to perpetuate the idea that that's the only thing that exists. It's archetype. Great. I'm about to use that when I remember that. It's good. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi, Paul. What was the um, second book you paired with Fry Bread? I'm sorry, I missed that one. Oh yeah, it's called Jingle Dancer. Okay. And it's a it's about a young girl who uh, wants to dance, and one of the the things that we thought was most important about it is she's connecting to history because it's dances that have been passed through generations, and then it's also that she goes from this person's place of work to this person's house to this person's place and it's an aunt and a grandma and a friend but it's it's not an aunt who lives in some like a stereotypical space on a reservation instead it's this person was a lawyer and is doing this and this person and, and it's not that the reservation is wrong and it's not that like a hogan is a, a bad place. It's just that it's not the only story that ought to exist. And that's kind of what we're thinking through. Thank you so much. You bet. We have a few more minutes if anyone has any other questions. Oh, here. Um, most of these pairings seem like you use similar texts to deconstruct one or more misconception or single story. Um, do you ever use two very different texts and juxtapose them? That's a great question. Um, we tried as best we could to, um, to pair texts initially for an obvious similarity, strong female protagonist, um, portrayals of forgotten histories, uh, something to like some sort of connection to mental health. We did though um, look outside of, we would often combine things like, oh, if this is nonfiction, what if we go here for like a contemporary re realistic or what if we go into a full-blown fantasy? Um, something like that. We were looking at um, Baseball Saved Us and then Alan Say's Home of the Brave, where in some ways it could kind of be fever dreamish and you're not really sure how much of is, if what you're seeing is, is really there, except it is all there, kind of like, a, um, like an underground railroad, railroad mm -hmm. take on things, whereby not being quote unquote historically accurate, you get to see what is maybe more capital T truth. So in general, we have tried to find an obvious pairing so that students would be able to talk through, oh, I see how this is like this, but then with some pretty um, nuanced differences as well. That's a great question. Any other questions? We have time, I think, for a couple more. I 
It's okay. Um, <laughs> I do have this one little micro exercise if anybody's willing to engage. I realize it's late in the day. You've gone to other sessions. You might, your brains might have already turned into scrambled egg. But just to show you that when somebody shows you what this, the single stories are, you're like, oh yeah, it's so obvious. And when you are shown like how they can deconstruct it or reify it, like, oh yeah, it's so obvious. But I think it, it's important as we're preparing to note like that this can actually be some really heavy work, right? And so if you're okay with reading a three or four page story together, are we cool with that? And then like the, the two questions just being, what potentially could this one deconstruct? What potentially could it reify? Um, if you're game, I'd love to share a little story with you. Anybody, get, are, we, are we cool with that, Terry? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Let me just pull up something. All right. The story is called, maybe tongue in cheek, maybe not. It is called Fables You Shouldn't Pay Any Attention To. It's by Florence Perry Hyde and Sylvia Worth Van Cleef illustrated by Sergio Rousier, okay? And so this uh, particular short story, which is illustrated and is just a few pages long, is called Cyril. All right, it reads thusly. Cyril and Jennifer were squirrels. They lived in the forest. Cyril was very, very, very selfish. That wasn't very nice. You're supposed to share. Jennifer shared, but not Cyril. Hey, can I have some of your nuts? One of the other squirrels would ask Jennifer. Help yourself, Jennifer would say. Hey, can I have some of your nuts? One of the other squirrels would ask Cyril. Drop dead, Cyril would say. You're selfish, Cyril, the other squirrels would say. You're supposed to share the way Jennifer does. Jennifer kept giving her nuts to the other squirrels. Cyril was too selfish. He kept all of his nuts to himself. Hey, can I have some of your nuts, Jennifer? Asked Cyril. Help yourself, said Jennifer. Winter came. Jennifer had given all of her nuts away. Hey, can I have some of your nuts? Cyril asked Jennifer. Drop dead, said Cyril. And she did. I'm glad I was selfish, said Cyril. It pays. That's how it actually ends. Okay. And so the two questions that can be asked, does it deconstruct or does it reconstruct? Maybe more appropriately, how could it deconstruct or how could it reify? Kind of a cool little exercise. Paul, are all of the stories in that book, I guess, of a similar vein? Yep, they're of a certain ilk for sure. And as you read, uh, it brings a smile to certain people's faces and a frown to others. And you're wondering, I mean, it's also a really cool uh, entry point into reader response, right? And what we bring to the story and what the story brings to us. Oh, yeah. Oh. I like what Cheryl was saying there. That reminded me a lot of uh, David Sedaris mm -hmm. and his book, Squirrel Seeking Squirrel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was good. Thank you. That was a surprise at the end. That made me laugh. Which could make for a good pairing, right? And maybe even yeah. our deconstructions and our reconstructions. Yeah. Cheryl, I love this idea of, of like maybe juxtaposing it with a giving tree. Because mm -hmm. the giving tree is, you know, kind of that story flipped on its head and it is also very unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, and I, and I think it, like, if you want to take it seriously, which people like me do, like, is it an indictment of capitalism? Or is it saying this is what we have to do to survive? I mean, like, it's, it can get some good conversations going. And what was the name of the book again, Paul? And I'll yeah, put yeah, yeah. the link. It's uh, Fables You Shouldn't Pay Any Attention To. Or should you? I don't know. <laughs> Good stuff. Mm. 
we has we have some comments in the yeah, yeah. chat about how this is the opposite of the ant and the grasshopper. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if anyone has any final questions or comments um, for Paul, because we are almost out of time. Um, oh, here, what, what is fables you shouldn't pay attention to about? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's just a, a series of little four page stories, and they're all kind of like that. One person is saving up for a bicycle, and this is what happens to them. One person is walking through a field, a raindrop is anthropomorphized and given some some human qualities and what happens to this raindrop. Um, but I what I really, really like about them is that there's this knee jerk reaction because we have been socialized to think a picture book will do a certain thing. There's the secondary reaction, which is, oh, kids won't, under, won't understand that, which is usually code for, I'm not sure I do. And then there's this third space, which is, um, if I put it in front of kids, would I be burned in effigy? Do I have the, you know, the clout within my community to actually do something like this? And do I trust myself? Do I trust my learners? If not, why not? And these are the kind of things that I think we got to start talking about together. No, absolutely. Well, Paul, thank you so much. You know, you this has been an absolutely fantastic um, session and I have a ton of books now that I need to add to my picture book library. Yeah. Um, and we are pretty much out of time. No worries. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I just ordered that Fables book. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a good one. It's a, and depending on who you share it with, <laughs> you, you might win some friends or you might lose them. So be careful. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, I I think uh, I think a few of those will work well. Um, I'm I teach high school, so a few of those will work well with some of the high school kids. Mm-hmm. And kind you of know, our notions, just yeah, our notions challenge. of childhood and our notions of right, wrong, binaries, and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. Challenge a few of them at the beginning of the year, maybe get some open conversation, get them back into the groove after a year mm -hmm. of online. Yeah, my the teacher candidates that I work with, if I I've sometimes used them at the begin that story at the beginning of the semester, mm -hmm. and I I know it's a single story and it's a stereotype. But there is a group of students who are absolutely appalled that such a text even was allowed to exist. You know, <laughs> how dare they ruin these pure little sources of, of strength and, and just goodness. I'm like, I think they might be more resilient than you give them credit for. They've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, if anything else, if nothing else, I think it'll, it would open up the avenue for, like you were saying, those, these conversations that kids are probably very equipped to have, oh, yeah. even though we think, you know, as adults, oh no, you know, we, we must keep them innocent for as long as possible. Yeah. Do you really think the seven-year-old doesn't know what divorce is? Or do you, do you really think they don't know that you're fighting? Come on. It's, it's all there. It's all there. All right. Well, Jason and crew, I better let you mosey on to different spaces and places, but it's been a pleasure. And until next time. Thank you so much. You bet. Have a good one. You good as well. You too. Take you care. Too. Yeah, give my love to Pennsylvania. Is that where you are? Or are you hanging out in Arizona right now? No, no. Maybe maybe before Christmas, I'll get back out, out that way. But I miss it. I miss it out west. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to go to a place that's 115 degrees right now. It's, go back it's when only, it's 75. It, yeah, it's only, only high 80s here now. But you know that dew point. That, uh -huh. That's what you probably miss is that east coast humidity. Oh, yeah, but that's the thing. When everybody's sweaty, it's okay. It's, it's when you're the only person who's sweaty that it gets awkward, right? So, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, good thank to see you so Paul. much. Take care. Good to see you and good to meet a lot of you. Okay, bye. Larry, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure working with you this afternoon. Yes, hope to see you again tomorrow. Yes, have a great rest of your day. Yes, you too. Thank you.
Thank you all. I'm going to shut the room now. Okay.